Hey, welcome back. I am Colin Weaver. You are once again watching the IT Dojo CISSP Questions of the Day, where I come at you each time and give you two questions so that you can get this CISSP exam thing done, complete, finito, put behind you. Let's make that happen. Here comes question number one. All right, here comes question number one. Which component of SCAP, the Security Content Automation Protocol, is responsible for going in and providing a standardized reference for publicly known security vulnerabilities and exposures? Here come a bunch of answer choices, a bunch of acronyms. Um, click pause, give it a look. When you think you got the right answer, click on play, and I will walk you through. First choice is the right choice, CVE, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. Uh, CVE is a standardized way of expressing a particular vulnerability or exposure and uh, allows it to be referenced with a CVE code value and then goes in and describes what that particular vulnerability or exposure is and just does so in a standardized way. And that way, if you use CVE, we can all talk apples to apples when it comes to understanding a particular vulnerability or exposure that's on the system. Um, absent CVE, you may have seen, say, different anti-malware vendors or antivirus vendors going in and describing it, uh, the same vulnerability in different ways, and that can cause confusion. And so CVE endeavors to go in and eliminate that. Uh, the other answer choices that are on here are obviously not correct, but let's go ahead and just talk about what they are because they are all part of SCAP. Uh, the next one is a common configuration enumeration. Uh, what that one does is it provides a standardized way to go in and describe uh, specific configuration issues or settings. Uh, and then again, uses a numeric value for them and then goes in and gives them consistency so that if you are uh, using this, you can go in and have a uniform way in a consistent way to go in and discuss particular configuration issues on a system. CPE, Common Platform Enumeration, is a list and a way for you to go in and have a consistent way of describing types of applications and applications that are on systems. So that uh, when we refer to a particular component of, say, an operating system or a particular piece of software, we do so in a way that is consistent and uniform. CVSS, the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, is in the end just a way to give a numeric rating, typically on a scale of 0 to 10, with 0 being the least uh, significant and 10 being critical. Um, we're going to give you a rating, numeric rating, that's hopefully easier to understand on just how severe a particular vulnerability is. And what it does is it will go in and it will look at the impact on confidentiality, integrity, and availability and create a ranking for that. And then it will go in and also give some consideration to um, things like, you know, what's the attack vector? Um, how hard is the attack to do? How much user interaction has to be involved? Uh, how mature are the known exploits? Uh, it'll take a lot of these different criteria into account and spit out in the end a numeric rating that makes it a little bit easier for you to digest just how severe this particular issue is. And then the last one on the list is XCCDF, which is the Extensible Configuration Checklist Definition. Uh, this is responsible for giving you an XML-based format that you can use to go in and create and have security checklists. Uh, again, it's a standardized approach to it because it's an XML format, it makes it extremely versatile, and that's what its job is. Um, so we were looking for what CVE, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposure in this. So. Um, Make sure that you're aware of the SCAP um, process, uh, what it's for, and then what the components of it are. Um, it is a very acronym-rich topic, so uh, make sure you take the time to kind of go in and digest what each of these components do, and then even take a look around and maybe some, some uh, SCAP tools out there that, that may help you go in and, and, and run some scans on systems and actually kind of get a flavor for it if it's not something that you've done before. All right, let's move on to question number two. Uh, this one's got a lot of words, but uh, you have a web application that regularly puts uh, and gets a lot of confidential information uh, using HTTPS. Okay. Your security admin is concerned uh, about the ability for somebody to uh, recover data that they've been collecting long-term um, if they should somehow gain access to and get control of the private key that's used by the server to create the HTTPS connections. I know what I just said is nothing like the words that are there, so forgive me for paraphrasing, um, just a lot of words. But um, my question for you is, is given that scenario, given the concern that your, your security admin has, which of the answer choices that I'm about to show you is the best recommendation or the best thing that you can do to mitigate the concern? Click pause, look them over, Give us some thoughts. 
when you think you got the right answer, click on play again and I will talk it through. First answer choice on the list says you can fix this problem by increasing the key size to 2048 bits. Um, if somebody has your private key, it really doesn't matter how long the key is. They have the private key. So whether it's a 1024 bit key or a 2048 bit key or something longer, doesn't matter. So that is definitely not the answer that's going to help correct or assuage the concerns of your security person. So no, don't pick that one. Ooh, how about you install a certificate with a lifetime not longer than 30 days? Huh, well, let's think about this. If you have a certificate, public key, private key pair that's used for only 90 days and then you change to a new public key, private key pair, uh, and don't renew the certificate, you just switch over to a new one, um, besides potentially creating a lot of work for yourself, uh, it's not that much work. It doesn't take long to do. But um, it's, if they get a hold of the private key, then we could say that we've limited the data that they can recover to say, a maximum of 90 days. But uh, that doesn't really stop them from getting that data for those up to 90 days. So I'm not really leaning towards that as being the answer. But let's look at the other choices and see if we can find something that's a better pick. How about you enable perfect forward secrecy on your web server, on the HTTPS server? Ooh, I like that. Perfect forward secrecy is a way of going in and largely fixing the concern of somebody getting a hold of private keys. So whether a, a, an adversary compromises your server and steals your private key, or law enforcement swoops in and physically seizes a server or demands access to the private key and they have a subpoena to go in and do it. Um, if any of those circumstances are things that you don't wanna have, then perfect forward secrecy is something that will help you. Um, because in perfect forward secrecy, your long-term keys are not actually used in the key exchange process. So if somebody actually gains a hold of them, they're not gonna be able to recover the actual encryption keys that were used for the HTTPS connections, um, even if they've been gathering the data for a long time. Because with perfect forward secrecy, typically what will happen is, is we will use our long-term keys to sign an ephemeral certificate or an ephemeral key that's then sent over to the, uh, to the user. And then we'll use that ephemeral key pair to do our exchange of actual encryption keys and then when we're done, we destroy those ephemeral keys. And if somebody were to come in and seize the long-term private key in some way, shape or form, then it doesn't matter because they can't use that private key to recover the keys that were encrypted or that were used to encrypt the data because the public key private key pair that were used in that exchange don't exist anymore. So that's what Perfect Fort Secrecy is gonna bring to the table for you and um, if that's an objective that you want to be able to accomplish of having to worry about that, then, then this is your solution. Okay. But let's look at the other choices. Make sure that there's not something better. There's not going to be, but let's just double check. Last choice says enable certificate pinning. Um, pinning a certificate, while maybe great in terms of speeding up connections and uh, helping you to mitigate fraudulent uh, certificates, it's not going to help with somebody getting a hold of the private key. So. Um, while certificate pinning may have value, um, I and mean, certainly it does have value, it doesn't have value in this context to help us go in and fix this particular concern. So don't pick that one. Okay, two more questions. Fini, done. Thanks for being here. I will see you next time.